Okay. First of all, I'd like to extend a few thanks. I thank you very much, Handheld, for providing the region and setting it up for us and even, you know, creating everything around us so we can have the meeting. Thank you very much. Um, I thank also Pam for coming over on short notice to have a little chat. I wanted to chat with her about government in OpenSIM for quite a while. I'm glad we could make that. <coughs> and I thank everybody else for coming, of course. Um, I was thinking we could just... Uh, uh, do this free form. Um, it's a little conversation. I, I, I wanted to pick Pam's brain about a few things um, governmental related, but if anybody just wants to chime in and say something or type something, type a question in local chat or just go on voice, then they can do so at any time. I think it's a small enough group so that doesn't require a lot of moderation. Sure, shoot. Um, I think you're crediting me with more forethought than, than I actually have. I never have any goal. I just wanted to make it... Um, basically, I, I, what, I, what I'm doing is I sometimes... I have a, a little podcast video thing. And sometimes I'm inviting people or go to someone else and have a chat with them. And then I'm, you know, it's more like an interview. And I was thinking about the same with Pam. Except that mm, I thought, you know, due to the recent events, uh, maybe some other people would be interested in, in what she has to think uh, or, or to say. So I wanted to make this a little bit more public. Does that answer the question? Um, I don't know if I have to I have to introduce Pam a little. She is uh, running the golf grid. Is that right? We, we started out put, w putting up an open sim government based grid quite a while ago, and what happened was when the army set up Moses, we ended up closing the actual grid and pretty much going over to Moses. So right now, all of our government-focused work in OpenSIM is, is based on Moses. Um, that was actually the first thing I wanted to know. Um, what exactly is it that you're doing? Or is that like confidential? No, it's... I don't think that I've seen anything over there that is. In fact, that's one of the requirements of that grid is that nothing is classified. So my role in it is more to be a li liaison between what's going on there and local government. So I created a plan for the next year, and I plan to put together a brochure. I'm setting up a SIM there for anyone in local government who would be interested in checking out OpenSIM. The people involved with Moses have also set up an implementation that people in government could use on their own computers, kind of like the SIM on a stick, except uh, I think it's more on a computer. And and so just kind of trying to be that liaison between what's going on there and local government and trying to encourage local government to use the technology and understand it. Um, so what exactly uh, as, a, as far as i understand moses is the military project it stands for something it's like an acronym but i don't remember what it was um what a, what how is the military using it well 
from what I understand, is they're using it to explore the technology and how it can be integrated into what they do. So a lot of what they're using it for is behind the scenes from where we're involved. Obviously, anything classified we would not be able to see. But then there's a lot of other people there who are involved in as consultants to government or contractors to government who are working on projects that are not classified. And then there's a lot of educators because a lot of the, the work there is education for the military. And they're exploring use of the technology for that purpose also. And, but you, uh, okay, so if I understand it right, you closed GovGrid down and or merged it with the MOSIS project. That, that's correct. We closed the grid. I still use the GovGrid website because, to me, I see that as the, the liaison part. That is where I, I would use that site to reach out to local government. It would be there for resources for local government for the work that's being done in Moses. And so how do you think a local government or, or government in general could benefit from OpenSIM? Well, some of the people who I've talked to who are in local government are using it for the purpose that I've been focusing on is using it to visualize designs or ideas that we would want to implement in our cities. But also for education, a big part of what we do is educating each other and educating uh, citizens. So I think it could be big for that. Okay, um, so it's it's not something that is like classically governmental. Like, uh, ah, you know, whenever I think of government, I think of open town hall meetings or something in open sim for some reason, and that is what comes to my mind. Um, but you are more like it's it's used as 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 a model space. Right now, I think that's the only application that we could implement immediately. I, I, we have talked about the town hall. We actually did a mock-up of what a future city council meeting would be like in a virtual world, and we taped it. But I don't see citizens right now using the technology to the point where we could actually viably host that. It would be great someday if we could. I think also what you've seen is that, and both of us have, I, I think, noticed this, what's happening here in the virtual world, the virtual communities, is mirroring what we work with out in physical communities. And so now I've also been trying to do things in OpenSim, in Second Life, to to integrate that, to apply what we've learned in the physical world to the virtual, and also what we're learning when we do hold meetings, like what you're talking about, public meetings, see if we can apply that back into the physical world. Because what we found on Moses with some of our public meetings, is the tools here drastically make a difference. They definitely help. They make the public meetings and the outcomes of those come about faster. It's easier. It's just a better platform in which to meet and try to work out solutions. That's what we found in what we did in Moses. So you mean uh, as a meeting for governmental employees and not so much as a meeting for the, the public? I think it can be both. I think it's just going to take time to get to that point where the the public is meeting with their own government officials. You know, that's what I was thinking about. I think, you know, I mean, as exciting as the technology is, I think it, it would be a little bit too far ahead of what the general population currently uses the Internet for. I think it would be too complicated to use for that, even though it is great if you if you get to it. Uh, I agree. I just think it's going to take time. Look, we have, what, 50,000, 60,000 users 
at any one point in Second Life. That's just not widely used enough to hope that we could get a community like, say, Chicago, their city council, offering a virtual meeting for their constituents. But someday, and hopefully it's not too many years down the road, we, we're starting to see federal agencies hosting conferences in virtual settings. So that's just the next step. That's correct. Well, you know, I, I think it both needs to mat mature. The, the technology needs to mature to a point where it can, you know, even hold that many avatars in a region. And the public needs to mature to, you know, feel free to use these technologies at all. How do you That's think wonderful. about... Ahead. Especially for, like, people that are homebound or something like that and can't attend meetings physically. I mean, I just think that would be amazing. That's exactly it. A lot of people can't make it to public meetings. And I just think that this technology would open up the opportunities for them quite a bit. Um. I think to the if you talk about government and virtual worlds, there's you know two sides to that. One is that the official governments are using virtual worlds, and then the other side is the one that probably most people have come here for, is how virtual worlds themselves should or, or can be governed. Oh, but maybe we should address Hans' question first before we go and over to the next. One. Well, from, from my perspective, the advantage it has is what people have found for any interactions between humans virtually. You're all here together, represented by avatars. People feel as if they know each other better, that they've actually shared experiences. We're over Skype, it's too distracting. You, you know how it is when you're taking a webinar or talking to someone. If something else happens in the room around you, you're more likely to be distracted than you are if you're engaged in a virtual setting. I think it also um, plays to use being more convenient. Uh, for instance, I didn't feel well today and I am sitting here in my nightgown <laughs> talking to you guys because I just didn't have the guts to get up and get dressed today. You know, if this was going to be a Skype meeting, then I may not have attended at all. Um, so I think that's one thing, especially for homebound people. Um, and you know, I just enjoy the anonymity of having an avatar. Uh, sometimes it allows me to say things that I might not would say if somebody could see me and watch me say it with my own mouth or know, you know, who I am. Or I, I might be inhibited about, you know, my background, what people would uh, see as my home or whether or not it was too dirty or or too not nice enough or something to that effect so I just I think it it has a lot of advantages over Skype just my opinion yeah I think that's right Han um, a virtual world is, is every bit as real to me as the real world. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think some of the things that OpenSim has over Skype are that it has a lot of, of technology that can be implemented that cannot be used easily in Skype, like you know, I can see that big media screen there, which, you know, is probably for media on a prim. Um, you can integrate video, you can integrate slideshows, you can integrate audio, you can integrate real 3D models in OpenSim, all of which it would be hard to to use in Skype. Yeah, that's true too.
Yeah, Olive's got a you point. Um, I think a lot of, of software that is aimed at, at virtual conferences or something is just very costly. Okay, we got new visitors. Hello. Have a seat. I hope you can hear me. Vanish, I was curious what you thought about other governments. I'm only familiar with the United States in their acceptance of the technology or how quickly they would try to do what we were talking about. Do you think like your country would be more willing to have an official government meeting in a setting like this than say some of the others? Okay, uh, well, for those who do not know, I'm, I'm living uh, in Germany, I'm, I am German, and I do work for the German government. Um, and I'm, I keep following the German internet uh, politics as closely as I can. Uh, I don't think that our particular government that we have right now is too keen on everything digital. Uh, they kind of have to be like led by hand to every l little thing that has to do with the internet. Uh, I don't see them using a collaborative space anytime soon. I. You know, it, it it communities are still struggling to get an email address for, the, for an official email address or website for their community. So I I don't think I don't think so. As an expatriate that's living here in Germany, just a general observation, it appears to me that they are somewhat distrusting of the internet and, and really, really, really uh, value their privacy. And uh, so they don't like to give out any kind of information digitally, especially because they can't see, they can't touch the whole and feel where that's going. And so they, they kind of have to have a little while to, to trust it. it. Do you think I'm, I have a good feel about that, Vanish? I think it depends. Um, it depends on what you use it for. Uh, if you, um, there are some uses for the internet that is very good for the public and for government in general. Like um, we have a an, a law here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there's a similar law for the states that is called for open access, um, which means that any citizen can get access to any public data and the um and the i know the united states government has a great site that is um <laughs> i'm sorry about the poses i just grabbed whatever i had in store at the time Yeah, you notice his is nice though, right? <laughs> that was pure, pure <laughs> 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 Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, welcome back everyone. Um, for those of you who haven't been before here before when we started, um, let me give a short introduction of what we what we're talking about. The the topic of the talk I or the, the meeting is government in virtual worlds, which has I think two sides to it. One side is what we've been talking about um, 
so far, which is how government is using virtual worlds and could be using it. Um, we were currently just... Um, Pam told us a little bit about her um, project that she's doing with the Moses Grid and previously with GovGrid. And um, I was talking about how the, the German government did not use anything like that. And um, the other side is that um, is the question of how virtual worlds themselves can or should be governed, which is something that has come up lately about in the, with the um, with the Osgrid uh, issue, um, which is also something we would like to talk about. Um, the meeting is. Well, I'm going to use voice. voice. Uh, uh, I'm, th I'm thinking Pam is going to use gonna voice as well, and, and whoever, whoever wants, wants to, to, whoever wants to is invited to use voice or text chat. It, it's up to you, really. But in order to hear us, you will have to have voice enabled. Does anyone still have questions or remarks or rants about how governments are using virtual worlds? Um, I, I was leaving, I don't know if, if people heard that. Um, I was just mentioning that there are great uses for not really virtual There's worlds, virtual but for, worlds the for the internet in regards to government. And... Um, a great example of that is the the U.S. government has a site that's called data.gov, I think, where you can um, get pretty much any data the the U.S. government is uh, keeping on 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 all kinds of stuff that uh, is government related, and um, just download it and use it for yourself. Um, the German government has something similar, but you still need to request that data. It's not that it's open and can just easily be downloaded. You have to write them a letter and ask them for the data, and then they will send you like an email or something and, and give you the data requested. Ah, uh, no, I didn't. Shoot, Han. Um, I can see that too. I think, you know, with um, if you if you want to hold something for the citizens that is easier for them to use than something that runs in a browser and requires it has a low level of entry, like you can just go to a website and you're getting automatically logged in, has a bigger appeal than something with like OpenSim that requires you to uh, uh, create an account and, and modify your avatar, which is also not necessarily be, uh, well, not even wanted maybe in, in an official governmental thing. I cannot think of anything worse than having a town hall meeting and somebody raises penis. So maybe a more controlled environment than like Jibe is, is better for that. I think it's a good point about the customization because you don't want to have any possibility of problems like you said. The problem with Jibe is that it's not easy to implement for someone in government or OpenSim. It's pretty much you can get you can get a region that's already made for your use and just tweak it a little and and it's it's done very cheaply where Jibe you pretty much have to hire a developer. Well, I don't know. Don't they have some some kind of a marketplace? Or does Unity not have some kind of a marketplace where you can just, I don't know, I guess purchase a pre-made 
region or even the pre-made world. I have to admit I'm not too familiar. They do have quite a bit. And it comes with world, a world that you can play around with, but I still think that the learning curve would be so high. Where open sim, it's really not too bad with a short amount of time in some direction you can get into it. Uh, Ariel, it's about both. Currently we're talking about real-life governments. We are going to move on to grid governments um, soon. Um, Anyone still got questions or, or remarks about real life governments? Let's talk a little bit about grid governments. Um, I have thought about this for quite a bit actually, and I, I'm going to go on a rant here, so bear with me. Um, Whenever I started in Second Life, um, it it kind of you know struck me very early that this world that I was in felt so much like a real place, and and meant so much to me. The people in it meant so much to me that I thought. It, it as much as this is important to people, it needed to have some kind of representation of the pres of the of the residents. Um, and I wondered why it didn't. And only later I f I thought, you know, what if a virtual world had an elected representation or was run by its pr its its residents? And I thought. It would go bankrupt pretty quickly because I think I, I guess the first thing any of us would vote on is to lower the the prices, right? Um, so we would all make it probably make it free, um, which would yeah render it bankrupt. So I don't know if a if a democratic government is is the right thing to do for a grid. Yeah, uh, well. I guess it's happening all over the world. The thing, the difference is that governments cannot really go bankrupt. They can always print more money, whereas grids cannot. They they have to, you know, they have bills to pay. And so, um, I don't think the residents can run the grid in the way that the the citizens of a of a nation can run the nation democratically but i think there's got to be some kind of representation there's got to be something that that makes the users heard and i really have not found a good solution for that to be honest is does anyone have a have an idea about that closest I've seen or heard people talk about is I mentioned this before is the benevolent monarchy I don't know if it was Drax that said that but you know I haven't really delved into it enough to know for sure if it would work but that's what England did is they had a monarchy the people pushed for more representation they ended up implementing a parliament structure like you say Vanish I agree they can't run the the actual grid but perhaps they can manage or run the community part of it and would a parliament structure work for that I don't know Well, um, I think there's two different issues. I think there's OpenSim as a whole, which is, at the face of it, actually pretty democratic in that everyone can start their own grid or their own uh, right 
they can they can everyone can can install their own standalone and is not dependent on someone else's services and um y you know if if every one of us would run their own standalone from i don't know from home or from their own rented server we would not have so much of a policy issue because there were no there would not be any grids um the thing is just that those of us who do run their own installations are in the minority. Most people are signing up for a grid and uh, have to then abide by that grid's rules for good or worse, whatever they might be. Um, and I don't see a, a, a good solution for people to, you know other than to vote with their feet and go to a different grid, um, to influence the, the, the administrative decisions of, a, of another grid, or of the grid they're part of. So when an owner of a grid starts a grid, he, establish, he or she establishes the basic rules of that grid, and what you're saying is that people are only going to go there if they agree to abide by those rules. But if you start a grid, you have to guess at what rules your community would want. Is it better to start out with some rules but yet be open to some community representation to bring different issues to a meeting? You can listen in and as a group decide if rules should be changed and as long as you felt legally you could accommodate those you would well um hans got a point um it's about the the community i mean it is always about community on both sides um both as a as a grid operator and as a as a like a user of the grid um people are in osgrid for the community, they're not on Osgrid because of the Great Welcome Region, or uh, because of I don't know, and uh, or people are on are on Craft because of the community, or on Metropolis because of the community, and the grid owners themselves they need that community because in the end those are the users who are going to pay your bills. Um, so it's it's. It's kind of a give and take. It's not that the users have no leverage. Um, it's just it's just hard to really gauge what users want, and and to sometimes you know you have a different vision vision for your grid than what part of your user base wants. So. think that's true and this is why I think it's so critical to do what I'm trying to implement for Second Life and that's a community plan. We do that with our real life communities. Just think if each grid established a comprehensive plan or community plan that would be best if they do that working with their community but then it would lay out, here's what we're all about, here's the rules we have, here's where we're going. Then if I'm looking for a grid to join, I'm going to look through their plans, and if I see one that matches my vision and goals, then that's where I'm going to go. But right now, we don't really know what those are for any grid. Uh, that's th I wanted to ask you about that, Pam, but hold on a moment. Te Teo brought something up that I, that I was just interested in. You said you had a, a poll on whether, for example, whether or not your users want to use money. Um, how did you technically do that? Was it on a forum or was it, um, how did you decide or find out? Well, how did you ask them? Yeah, but do you, yeah, do you, do ask, you, you ask each, each one, one individually?
So th was that like on a on a meeting like like Osgood has the town hall meetings where you regularly meet up and everybody can attend? Okay. So maybe that blends in with Pam's community plan. Pam, can you because I still don't get it. Can you explain to me what a community plan is? Yeah, it's primarily something that's really got a lot of push in about the 1960s in the United States. They decided that each city should have a type of comprehensive plan. And when you create one or when you amend the one that you already have, what you're doing is you're looking at who's in your city the demographics, what they want, what they're all about, where you've been, where you kind of want to go. And then you look at the factors that influence that. Now for a physical community, it's going to be your roads, your education, the parks, all your businesses, everything, your economic climate. But in the virtual world, I thought, you know, what, what would it be here? Well, when I really thought about it, I thought a lot of that is really similar. All those things affect our well-being, our happiness, our ability to make a living here. So in looking at each of those aspects, you say, where is it at today in our community and how is it affecting us for good or for bad? Where do we want it to be? And what do we need to do to get it to that point? And who's going to help us do that? Is it going to be the citizens? Will, will it be the, the government, the people who can actually make that change for the city? And then you write it all down. And the community plans or the comprehensive plans are very important as you have businesses or developers come in. The community I'm in now, they made an active decision not to have anything automotive related. So they don't have any dealerships. Now, that makes a huge difference on a lot of things, land use, because of the size that those properties took up. And now when they're all moving out, it would have left a huge unused area. It also makes a big difference on income. Yeah, it created income during the years cars were selling, but now that they're not, those cities losing those businesses are losing a significant amount of revenue that they had depended on. So all those decisions you make in your plan have ramifications to your future. But isn't every community quite a mixed lot? Um, if I think about, uh, well, real life communities, there's older people, there's younger people, there's kids, there's m parents, there's singles, there's businesses, there's all kinds of different groups of people with different goals how do they get to come to like a, a, a common resolution well that's part of the process you, through meetings through surveys through all these different techniques you collect what the community is telling you and then you write the plan you send it back out for review and then amend it if the community indicates it needs to be and then you adopt it and anyone coming in later like when we get automotive people now we say i'm sorry but our comprehensive plan does not want that now eventually 20 30 years down the road the generations change and maybe the community does decide and but they constantly amend the plan so hopefully that keeps up with the changes but yeah each community is very different um, so that there is a, a process or, or kind of a, a method methodology in place where you can change the plan later on. Definitely. And 
really uh, what you should be doing is every year you should be looking at your plan and saying, did, did we meet any of the goals? Is it working for us? And when the planner, who's kind of the main person at the city who, who lives with this plan every day, he's the one who best can see when it starts going awry. And then it's his job to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, it's starting to kind of cause issues here. It's time to amend our plan. Um, but doesn't that cause like this the same dilemma as always that there's the vocal min minority who, who makes all the rules or how do you make sure that really a lot of people get involved in the planning? The way we do it is it's open to anyone. Anyone can come to the meetings, anyone has a voice, anyone can send in cards, letters, information, take surveys. You have to consider everything. Well, if we if we go to um, let's say go to Second Life or go to the Osgood issue, um, it would then probably be that I don't know, like the grid management would send out a survey to its users, and if the feedback from most people would be that they do not do not want kid avatars on their grid. Then the community plan would involve no kid avatars. Uh, that's how I would imagine it to be. And the kid avatars would just have to, I don't know, see, look for an, an, a grid that allows them. That would be true, although now <laughs> it's this is where it's interesting between the physical community and virtual. In our physical communities, we cannot discriminate now so you can never make a plan saying we don't want this type of person well, now in I a virtual so. community i would think in a virtual world you should not discriminate either but it seems like it kind of just goes unprotested well and that's what's so fascinating about the difference is in is a child avatar are you discriminating you know obviously in the physical world that's not one of the protected classes but should it be here and that's the type of discussion i think all of us need to have is what are the protected classes in the virtual world well i, I would argue it is discriminating why, why would it not be discriminating to to tell someone that because of your like you, you can either see it as your exterior or as your lifestyle choice. I mean, it's it's either it's either one or the other, and both are you, you should not discriminate against. I mean, that's my personal feeling because I, I that's actually one of the things I love about the virtual setting is everyone can portray themselves however they want, and it makes me actually even less chance of discriminating because you don't really know what anyone's all about and they can change tomorrow how they look so I love this for that I think it causes us to be less discriminatory um, is there is there like a reason for for that Tao I mean why do you not want child avatars here? Did we crash? I don't think so. Okay. Okay.
Okay, so that was more like. Okay, um, I think the elephant in the room is 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 the the sexual age players, who um, kind of are looking for a home everywhere, and uh, I I don't think anybody would want to have that kind of activity on their grid uh, for you know understandable reasons. Um, I just don't know if banning all child avatars is a good measure against that. It is certainly. Um, a, a good uh, policy to um, like uh, not have to gauge in each individual case but I think there should be a better solution Okay, so if I understand it correctly, you do that on a on a case by case basis. If someone is in a child avatar and you encounter them, you ask them that they change their appearance, and you know that's pretty much it. I think part of it would also be the reason the grid is there. Like I know in Moses, that's solely there for government use, for military use. And so we all decided there that we definitely did not want certain types of avatars. It's just not possible. But in a social grid, it makes me wonder what would be the problem in someone's appearance, the behavior, yes, but the appearance, I, I'm not quite sure. I think it'd be hard to police. Well, yeah, it, it would be hard to police. And, and, you know, it's not a, from what I understood, it's not a general, like like a, a grid-wide rule on Ausgrid. It is, it just affects their official plazas, which is the, the public regions of the Ausgrid um, administration. Um, of course, this 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 policy makes child avatars feel unwelcome there. So I can understand if people are just giving up on the grid altogether. Um, I just thought I, I can understand why I can understand the thinking behind banning child avatars because you want to uh, remove every possibility for that kind of behavior to be to surface on your grid. Um, and and as I said, in, you know, you don't have to police everybody every t all the time by just telling them that you know you shouldn't be. And it, with a child avatar here. And and I have to say that I don't even know how big the problem is or was, uh, how many people actually ha were engaged in sexual age play or how many cases of it there were, if there was a, an epidemic or, or, or a real problem there at all. Um, or if it's just perceived uh, problematic. I think they have a good point in chat in that it may not have even been a problem asking them not to have a child avatar in the public spaces, but it's, it, the key is how it was handled. And again, that they should have reached out to the community probably. Yeah, you know that, but that is the other the other thing. I mean, what what community is there? It's, it seems like the community is very divided on that issue. And actually, 
uh, about of half of the community is backing the administration and the way it has been handled. So, uh, which community do you reach out to? Good point, and part of their struggle is they let it go on so long that now they're trying to impose something, and you do risk that. You risk losing the people who don't want to agree to whatever you decide on. Okay, let, let's let's think about handling this as a user. Would you have felt better towards that policy if um, the management would have, let's say, made an announcement on the website stating that you know child avatars are becoming a problem? We are thinking about changing that rule and uh, want to. Um, implement the rule that there are no child avatars allowed on the plazas anymore. You can voice your concerns in the comments. And then like two weeks later, there's another announcement that the rule is going to take uh, hold at some certain date. Um, would that have been a, a better place, a better way to handle it? I think so, because that's how we do it in our physical world. I think the way they did it now scares me even when I don't do anything at all that I think would be considered out of the ordinary, because the f way they did that makes me think they could do that to anyone for any reason now and you would have no say or, or no knowledge of it yeah that that's the thing that that, that concerned me too and um y even though I, I you know i still do trust them not to uh, pull some something out of their sleeve just to ban someone uh, it, it makes you wonder what, what what other rules there are or could be that you you might unknowingly break. I mean, I'm I'm not a regular on Osgood, so I know that you know maybe I don't have a reason to feel that way, but I do think if they would just come right out and do this and implement it just like that and not give anybody any say so not take anyone's ideas or, or comments into consideration that they would do anything so no i i don't trust them at all with anything i mean i think if you stay there you stay there with that indecision with that not knowing that any moment they could just come in and say uh, we don't like females with red hair or you know, men with, I don't know, that are over five foot tall, or I mean, whatever. They could do whatever they whatever wanted they to. Wanted to. Right, Sarge, and there's nothing that you can say or do about it because they're the big wigs and they can do whatever they want and you're just at their mercy. And I think anyone that chooses to stay there has to live with that knowledge that they're just there and they just, you know, whatever, I may be here today and I may be banned tomorrow. Isn't that true for every grid or every service you use that you sign up for it knowing that the operators can change the rules at any time the way they want to 
and you just have no recourse. I mean, isn't that true for Twitter or Facebook or Google or anything? I mean, you know, I'm running a service, and and even though I I hope I'm I'm moderating it right, I I don't have any rules put up front or anything, and I don't know what people expect exactly. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. It does. Um, you know, I mean, anyone could do that. SL could do that if they wanted to. I mean, I'm in SL almost every day. They could just decide all the fashionistas have to leave and I'd have to be gone. You know, but this sets a precedent. I mean, what they have done is something that I don't know of too many other major grids have done. And so it, it kind of sets a precedent, and especially for them in particular, to where you can't trust them. And, and even though we kind of live with that knowledge that, yeah, they can do whatever they want to to me, they never have. I mean, not really. I mean, yes, there have been people that have lost their inventories and people that have been banned for no good reasons. And we all know people that that have happened to. But to have a large user base like this just cut off simply for the way that they look is is a little unprecedented i think and 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 good cause for people to stand back and and say wow wait a minute i mean it, it gives me pause i think you're right and the way i've looked at it is at like their city and I've read their responses as if they would be city staff responding to citizens. And you have to ask yourself, is that the way my city would talk to me? And I think if you're a grid owner, if you're running a grid, even though you have those God powers, you still have a community there and they really need to almost act as city staff and, and speak to people that way. We would be fired if we spoke to our citizens the way that they I've seen what they've said in forums and in chat you just don't talk to your community like that that's right it's all a little bit about respect and you know I feel like they just haven't given that if they had just presented it differently or at least tried to listen to what some people said but from what I've heard you know that that was not the case people were just cut off and it was this is the way it is you know i mean it was like an authoritarian kind of thing a dictatorship where it's just like that's it if you don't like it get out and and you're right you know you, you shouldn't treat the people that that are the ones that pay your bills that way i mean we deserve a little bit better respect than that So it's like in a way if you were coming up to us at the city and you wanted a building permit to build something that's not allowed, I can explain to you why it's not allowed and you can be upset about it, but I don't say, well, you know, too damn bad and get your stupid permit out of here. I'm not, there ain't no way in how I'm giving it to you. We just can't, we don't talk to people like that. You know, and like you said, it's respect. You have to treat people right. That's right. That's right. So they fix it. You know, at this point, that's the other part going through my mind. Okay, everyone can make a mistake. Everyone might not know how to handle citizens, basically. But how do they fix it now? I think it's a bit too late for that. Um, well, as far as Osgrid is concerned, I think the the residents that have been put off by that way of handling things have left and probably aren't going to come back. Um, they can only like learn from it for future uh, decisions and future ways of handling their community and do it better. Then, uh, from what I've heard, is they they cut down on a lot of community interaction. Actually, during that process, they don't hold the town hall meetings anymore, and instead could have some kind of a note card system in place where people can just um, send in suggestions through some kind of a mailbox, and out of these suggestions, the grid management can then 
take them into consideration. It's really, there isn't a lot of feedback. Um, and, and I don't think the, the people in charge understand the problem there much. And I don't think, I don't think the current user base is, is able to explain it to them either. So it's just going to probably ship along as, as it does. Yeah, I think if Osgrid wants to do that, whether they don't care about the current community or they want to change or whatever, I think they need to look at what would a real life city do at this point, and they really need to come out and just say, "Here's what we're trying to do." Explain to people if they're if they're honest and forthright, then yeah, maybe they'll still lose some people, but that would be a big step in moving forward. Yeah, but what would a real life city do uh, would they amend their policies at that point i don't i don't think so i don't i don't know any politician who would want to lose face in in saying okay we we fucked up there i'm sorry we we will take that into consideration and change our policy again i think they would stick to it and you know carry on right If they want to keep their policy and, and that's their decision, then they could still come out and say, look, you know, there's no way we're changing this, but we understand that we could have handled this differently. And here's how we want to move forward. You know, we are going to be more open and honest. We're going to handle things, you know, by speaking out to our community and keeping and communicating with you. That would be the moving forward if they want to keep that policy. Now, if they want to look at changing it or at least consider it, then it's, hey, we need to have some meetings and talk to our community. And should we do this or not? Like you said, go from the back to where maybe they should have started putting that information or that question out at the start. I think that would absolutely be the way to handle it. I just am not sure that given the attitude that I've seen come from the current management that that is ever going to happen. Um, so it doesn't leave the community with much choice. And I was reading through Han's comments. You think they want less people to be there? You think they're in over their heads and they, they want less people? I'm not sure I understand. That's a great statement because that is the problem someone who manages a community makes is they get too into their work and they think, well, if only I could just do this work and not have the people bother me. But the only reason you are there is because of the people. So that, that's amazing when you say I think people are a distraction because that is a huge mistake community managers, city staff might make. In what? Wow. In what way? I didn't. I didn't understand that. Um, like the. I mean, the community is their job, right? That's exactly it. But when you're working and you're doing your job and you're trying to get stuff done, and people are constantly coming in to talk to you and get help from you. You can very easily go, oh, you know, I'm just trying to work and get my job done. If it weren't for all these people bothering me, I could finally get something done. But in reality, if it weren't for those people, you wouldn't have your job. And I think sometimes some people lose per that perspective. Okay. Um, I'm trying to, 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 to get to 
to to that. So, what do you think, or what what hand do you think uh, is is do they conceive as their their job actually? I mean, is, do they think Osgrid being the test grid for Open Simulator is their job is to test the software? I think what she's trying to say is that it it is their cognitive decision. I mean, you know, they understand that they're there for the people. They they get that. But when you're there for the people, say, and and you've got all these bugs that are coming up in your your stuff, and you've got to mess with it and get it all fixed, you can tell I'm a fashionista and know nothing about any of this, right? And they're trying to fix all their bugs and get them all done, and then you have Joe Blow that's knocking on your door and says, hey, you know, I was just wondering what's going on with my region. It doesn't work like this, and I wish I could do that. And then you have Sally that comes in and says, golly, man, we're having so much lag, and it's just been terrible. What is going on? And then you have someone, you know, all these people coming in with their little gripes and concerns and complaints, which is your job. But you can't get anything fixed or done for listening to all the people that are coming to you with their wishes and wants and desires, whether they're founded or not. And so they, they feel like the people are a bother. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Does that make yeah. any sense? Well, I understood what you're saying. I just wonder what would be a good way to handle it um, apparently sorry um, I heard what I know I understand what you're saying I'm just wondering what would be a good way to handle that um, like regular meetings are they good or bad do they do they work better than the note card system that they have in place right now or is it you know would it be better to organize community stuff on a, on a forum or on a blog. I, I don't really know that. It's the way I always look at is what would a real life community do and what we do is we don't, we have people who are there just to interact with the community. I really think they need to start look, acting more like a city and they need to hire staff so that they can work on like what Elle's saying, they need to work on the computers. Hire people who know what they're doing, who are economic development directors, who can work with your businesses, people who are community development people who work with your community. Let them do the talking so you can do the work. Well, that would require you to have people that you can trust and who would, you know, you, you know, who would talk on your behalf the way you want them to um, that's hard to, to find really we have in our cities that's who we hire it, those that's the, your profession so everyone who's an economic development director everyone who's a community development director they're all trained to do that for their city so that's what's so interesting about this. There's already all these professions out there doing it for physical communities. It would be nothing to just translate or transfer those skills into the virtual. So how do you make sure that what they're telling people is in line with official policy? think that when you hire them, when you interview, you have discussions and you find out what their, I guess, what their feelings are about it. Are their goals and beliefs aligned with yours? Are they a professional in that? Are they going to handle it professionally? Do they have experience dealing with the public? And, and then you, you evaluate them. Again, handle it just like we would handle it in our regular cities. I mean, you know, 
for a grid that's based on donations, I don't think they can really hire staff for that. I don't think they have the, m the money to do that. I, I can see where they can, you know, have volunteers. Um, and I think there's lots of people in the community who would volunteer for something like that. So I think that would be a viable solution. Um, does it also work on the other way around that, you know, the people who you hire to manage the community can get feedback from the community to you, or is that not the best way? Yeah, definitely, that would be part of their job, as you said, whether it's volunteer or someone you're paying. It, they're like the liaison. How are they doing it in in, in real life? Real life. I mean, are they are they having office hours or are they just I don't know? Do they have meetings where everyone can come or do they like actively go to the people? I'll give you an example of our economic development director because she's just incredible. She's got her profession down, and what she does is. She does many things. She'll go and actually walk from business to business to talk to business owners, find out what they need. She goes to a lot of meetings where people who are business owners would be at so she can hear what's going on with them. She also has people where they can come to her office. She hosts meetings for different reasons, uh, like maybe our downtown businesses. She has a meeting just for them. And then she interacts with us as staff, whether it's through email or through staff meetings. And she's that liaison, bringing back what she's hearing from them, what we need to maybe look at changing. And, and she's also talking to elected officials or through our city manager she, or our city administrator, she'd talk to this, the elected officials. And okay, and I'm curious, how are the people in power then taking that kind of input? Are they like, is it just going to the files and in order to be forgotten, or how does it become policy? Oh, definitely. We it does not just get you know shoved by the wayside. Everything she brings back, we talk about at staff meetings. We obviously have to look at existing rules and ordinances, how it would fit into that if someone had a request that something be changed. But everyone's very open and responsive because for us, just like many cities, particularly economic activity is huge. It's what helps you be successful. So they're very open to listening and considering changes. Well, what do you mean, Teo? Well, in, in what way? I mean, it is different from real life. Apparently, we are... But what do you do if one community doesn't like the other community? You mean choices in in the number of grids they can go to? I 
think that what Pam is saying is really not that different from what you had talked about earlier, where you said that you go to your uh, various members in the community and ask them what they want, and you have meetings to see what everyone agrees on, and then you kind of, you know, set up your rules based on that. I, I think what Pam is saying is not, you know, really that different. She's not trying to make rules, for, you know, that says that anyone necessarily has to stay, especially, or go, but that still you're having some kind of response from the general community uh, about what every, well, the majority of the people want. And I think, you know, what we're trying to figure out is that if that is, there is a model that is successful and is working in real life, where we do have lots of imperfections, that perhaps that same model could work and be good here in our virtual worlds where we have a much more perfect world. Um, you know, perhaps that some of those same things could be used. I, I don't think that she's really trying to say that anyone can't be free to go. That's true, Al, and I guess in a way, it, if that's how they run their grid, then, then that is what they're doing, is they're talking to our residents and they realize they want to have a lot of choice, so that's how they decide to, to run it. It's still by talking to them, like you said. Do you think that Second Life is doing it better in any way? Well, I don't think they've talked to people like OS Grid did. I think that's the key. You, you mean they don't talk to them at all? Yeah, I, I think that's. I, I hate to. I hate to assume what they're doing, but they might have done like what Elle was saying, where it's like we're trying to do all this stuff. People are a distraction, like Han was saying. Um, it's maybe better just to not talk to them then. Then talk to them and risk doing something like what happened in Oz Grid. I mean, we, we hear pretty much similar complaints whenever a second life is concerned from the residents that, you know, you never listen to us and, you know, you're just doing what you want and you have no clue what we want. and. And it just makes me wonder if, if, if what they're doing is so much better. I think the only thing that's better is that they're not talking to them with disrespect. But you're right, they're still kind of ignoring the community. I think the key is that the people running these grids sometimes don't realize that, like you just said or when you started this, this is a place. And... A lot of people haven't figured that out yet. They still think it's software. I don't know about that. I mean, why would you want to run a grid, uh, you know, it, over any other kind of software you can run? Um, I guess in order to to choose OpenSim for your for your venture, you have to have some kind of an idea of what it's about and how people like to use it, right? I would think, and I think Philip knew that. You know, I think he had it down, but I, I just think it's it's very easy to fall into that trap of losing perspective that you're only here because of the community. I, I don't know. That's just my take on it from what I see happening in cities. Hmm. No, I, th I think you're generally right. I don't know that SL is doing or has done anything necessarily better. Um, they have not banned any particular group from being an SL. Uh, Vanish and I were talking about this the other day uh, on our way home from uh, a different city. and. 
while they have not banned anyone, you know, they did feel like there was a problem with the so-called adult community and the adult activities that were going on. And so the way that they handled it was to uh, send them off, you know, to a certain region. They made a certain place for them. That's where they can go and they can do all the little weird stuff that they want to do, you know, and not be bothered by um, anyone else. And um, that way it would so-called protect the rest of the citizenship. And I feel like they have done that in a fairly respectful way. Um, you know, that there is, as you said, you know, that's that's the some of the difference there between what has happened at Osgrid and between uh, SL. Osgrid has been very ab abrasive about their new decisions. And uh, SL has just kind of taken on a, a a quiet stance where they just kind of quietly ignore uh, most of the time the people and what they have to say. You know, we would like to believe that they are still listening every now and then, you know. I hope they are. I really do. Um, but as far as, as actually affecting a change and getting things done, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that they're really any better at it. I just think they handle it with a little more tact and a little more respect than, than some of the other places have. As far as what I want Osgrid to do, I, I don't know that I want them to do anything in particular right now. I mean, they have the ability to do whatever they want to do. It's just the way that they've done it that, that people are upset with. And Vanish and I have talked about this at length as well. And I do think that if they decide that they don't want child avatars there, that's their own business. You know, they, I suppose, can do that as owners or administrators of the grid. I think it's unfortunate to ban any one particular group, to absolutely ban them. I, I think it's unfortunate as long as they're not doing anything illegal. And I don't think that they can prove that they are. You know, we were talking about one friend of ours in particular that, because, you know, I'll be honest, and I'm sorry if I offend anyone here, but I have, at times, found child avatars to be a little creepy for me. I mean, they, they bother me a little bit. But I don't want to ban them. I, I would never ban them, you know, and I couldn't quite understand why anybody would want to play a child avatar. And then we had a friend of ours that said that she likes to play one in a role-playing type thing where they, they do the Harry Potter thing, you know, and they grow up while they they do all this stuff. And I thought, you know, that might be kind of fun. I mean, I might could get into that, and it kind of made me see where maybe... I could be a child avatar and do something like that and I would hate it if I was doing something totally innocent that wasn't hurting anybody and was having a good time doing it to think that I couldn't be in Osgrid just because I'm a child. I, I, I think that's unfortunate. Shoot, Tom, go ahead.
Yeah, well... Yes, I, I can, I can, you know, um, I think most of us know that there has been a grid called Meta Seven in the past, which kind of was the same as the Infinite Grid sounds to be now, um, and they had to close down because uh, the law enforcement was very interested in was or started to become interested in what was going on on their grid. Um, And and I don't think anybody would want that kind of activity on their grid. As I said, I can understand not wanting that. Um, that doesn't mean that I assume that everybody who's got a child avatar wants to use it for sexual age play. Um, and, you know... I didn't even think everybody in Meta 7 wanted to do that. I'm I'm pretty sure it's a small minority even there that did that. Um, it's just that this small minority kind of took over or, or became the, the focus point of the grid to, you know, for better or worse. And, and that's unfortunate. I can see, Tao. Um, when you're talking about having educational sims here, if that is the type of grid that you are wanting to perpetuate, you know, if you want to really cater to the educational community and have the majority of your users here be those that, that are part of that educational community, I can understand you being concerned. And I could understand that. You know, I could understand you saying, you know, because of the type of grid we have, we prefer not to have this particular type of, of avatar. Because you have then specialized your grid. You know, you're not just a grid that, although you are open to anyone, you are really more specialized to the educational group. You could try doing something like uh, SL did, where you, you could try the zoning thing, although I don't know really how well that works, but it could be said that you had done something to try to control that. Um, but, um, you know, when you have specialized and, and made your grid cater to a, particu a particular group of individuals, then I could see you saying that perhaps, you know, no, we don't want that. Whereas Osgrid doesn't have that excuse. I mean, I don't think they really cater to the educational group. Um, you know, I mean, everybody is open to um, an open grid. You know, SL is an open grid. They have a few educators left there, not many. But a few, you know, and so they've, they've done those things like try to make, you know, a restricted area where the adults can go and do what they want to do. But, you know, just to say that you can't have any child avatars, it, it really is going to limit the people that you can cater to. And if you want to just cater to the educational group, then that's great, you know, go for it. But you kind of, if you cater to that and say, we want the educational people here, then you've kind of limited, you know, that that kind of excludes the other group and really kind of does make you not so much an, an open grid if you're going to say that a certain group cannot be here because we have this other group here. Not that I think there's anything wrong with that. You just made me think of something, Al, when you said that is do you think it would be beneficial if grids grids were zoned so like you choose a zoning for your grid so everyone understands when they go there isn't it adult grid is it what a business grid whatever i think that would certainly be a possible answer to the problems that we're talking about um you know of course nobody wants pedophiles in their community but it's, I just think it's not right, you know, just to say you can't come here because you're a child avatar if you're not doing anything wrong. So, yeah, if you 
fixed it that way, then, you know, anyone could pick and choose which grid, part of the grid they wanted to be involved with. So, yeah, I think that, that might be a good solution. Um, I can see both sides. And I understand Tao when she, when she makes a policy. I don't think there's a problem with banning children or child avatars, just as there isn't um, a problem with banning furries or or not allowing robots or whatever, um, as long as that is communicated up front. And I think that is part of it. Was what Pam said: if you if you create a grid and you have a certain vision for it, you have to. I think you have to explain p to people before they sign up for your community what exactly it is that you have in mind, what you what kind of community you want, what kind of behavior you want, what kind of behavior you do not want, and what kind of people you do not want on your grid. And, you know, it's your right to make those those decisions because in the end it's, it's you know, your endeavor, your project, and you, you know, you have to live with it being uh, a failure if, if that doesn't go over very well. Um, and so I don't think there's a problem with not allowing child avatars, but there is a problem with um with with you know retroactively in <coughs> implementing that kind of policy oh. and communicating it uh the way that it has been communicated there's a lot of good points that came out tonight that would really help grid owners, just like what you said. You know, if people knew that, hey, I'm going to start a grid, I need to figure this out ahead of time and let people know. Yeah, you're right. I should have read a tutorial about that. That would be that really would be helpful. <laughs> That's more of a joke. But I actually had thought about writing a tutorial on, on a little bit about community management and what I, you know, not that I'm an expert on it, what I would I would like to see and would I would like to think our best practices and you know maybe I'm gonna do that after the meeting I don't know but it was it is a great meeting um, though we are pretty far advanced does anybody still have something they would like to talk about Yes, and I appreciate that, Tao, that you have not banned anyone. I mean, I think you've taken a, a very nice middle-of-the-ground um, stance on it, you know, by talking to them and, and explaining, you know, why you don't prefer that and would they please use a different Abby while they're here. Um, I think that's, that's very nice. And uh, the fact that you don't ban them, even if they choose not to, you know, also says a lot about you. Um, you know, I think that's that should be appreciated. Um, yeah. Um, to address that, um, Liko and Tao, we, we are here because we like craft. Um, we had the plan to hold a meeting on government in, in virtual worlds, and I was originally planning to hold it on Osgrid. Uh, because it, you know, it's the most widely known grid, and mostly everybody has a has an account there. Until people said, you know, we have been banned from Osgrid. How are we going to attend? And then, you know, the choice was either Metropolis or Craft, because these are the most open grids I and most of the community know of. And since a lot of Osgrid users cannot travel to Metropolis because uh, Osgrid has banned travel from Osgrid to Metropolis as well. We choose on Craft because we we do think that Craft is one of one of the most open and friendly and and liberal cri grids that OpenSim has. So that is why we're here. Kind of like a virtual Sweden in all of this, I think. <laughs> we really do appreciate it. Thank you so much.
You'll have to excuse me if I seem to get a little riled up at times. I, I have a tendency to be very passionate about certain things and um, when I talk about them I kind of get loud and rowdy. I'm, I'm sorry it's part of my Texas upbringing I guess but um, I just wanted you to know that that you know we love you guys and appreciate what you're doing and think you're doing an awesome job. Um, I, I just get a little excited sometimes. Sorry. I have to echo that because I am so into government and virtual worlds now. I get way too into it and passionate too. And sometimes I think like, wow, people are probably going back off. Well, I think the things that we're talking about are really important. And while they are dealing with a virtual world and what a lot of people perceive to be a game, the principles that, that are applied here are the very same ones that, that are applied in real life in so many circumstances as far as the ability to work with one another and understand each other and be willing to listen to one another and have respect. I mean, those are things that should not be discarded regardless of what world you're in. Those should travel with you wherever you go. And, and so those, those things are important. So yeah, I get a little passionate about it and vanish. Oh, gee, he is, is really much more into government than I am. And he and I sometimes have some very passionate discussions about government and government roles. You know, I have a tendency to be a conservative and he has one to be a liberal. And so sometimes it's hard for us to find a nice, place in the middle where we can meet. You know, our very first fight ever was over politics. So we learned real quickly that we need to be careful with that one. But, um, you know, we, we those are just things that, that you need to take with you anywhere you go as far as being kind and generous and caring and understanding and listen. I mean, those are all things we were supposed to have learned in kindergarten, right? But unfortunately, sometimes I think that when we come to a virtual world and are afforded that anon anonymity, being able to be anonymous, that we throw that out the window, you know, and just think we can be rude and ugly and mean to each other without any consequences. And nothing is farther from the truth. Hello, Jer. Ger. Ger. <clears throat> well then. Um. Yes, he came to welcome us when we were at the other place. It's a very nice job. Well, I thank you all for coming. Um, I think this is a good place to adjourn. Uh, thank you, Pam, for coming over. And it was a very interesting discussion. We might do that again sometime. Um, see if anything has changed. And thank you, the good people of Craft, for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting to me. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap, wrap it up here. Um, I will probably upload uh, a recording later on and uh, share that on Google and on my blog. And, well, thanks again. Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it. It was good to meet each one of you. Look forward to it again. Thank you.